Hey, so good morning, everybody. I'm the director of Woodlawn and Pope Leahy House, an iconic historic site in Alexandria, Virginia, where we like to use makers and artists and creators to help us tell our stories. Today, I am very delighted to interview Roxana Alger Geffen, who is our special artist this year at what was to be our 57th annual Needlework show. We only got through about 11 days of the show so far, but um, 11 days of visitors did see Roxana's work as part of a special event at that show. And we hope that when we get to reopen the site, later in the season that lots more people will be able to come and see her work there. Well, it's lovely to see your face, Amanda, it's lovely to get a chance <laughs> Thank to say hi. So I'm just gonna say a quick moment about you, which is that you, um, I think you were raised in New York, but you went to BU for your MFA, which by the way, is where I got my master's degree also, mm -hmm. not in art. But since it's Mother's Day weekend this weekend, I think it is important to say that you are the mother of three children. And so, you know, we're sort of celebrating you in particular. We wanted to interview you today in particular because your work is so related to family and relationships and the sort of generations of people who have mattered so much to you. So um, let's get right into it. I think the answer to this might be yes, um, which is do you have a studio in your home? And it looks I like that you do. Well, actually, no, I'm in my out of house studio. Ah, I'm in okay. My okay. Studio. Um, I don't anymore really have a home studio because um, I, it was too, it was too hard for me to get into the mindset that I get into where I really feel kind of um, free to kind of go through the process of letting go of everything and letting things just kind of happen in my head. Mm -hmm. I worked have worked outside of the house for for many years, but since obviously we're all quarantined, um, and now that my three kids I'm were they're doing distance learning, um, my husband actually works. Um, he's an essential worker, so he wor he's working every other week, and mm -hmm. so the weeks that he's home, I get to be here at my studio. Um, but when he's at work those weeks that I'm in charge of the kids, I have sort of taken over the guest room, which is a tiny room to begin with. We just wanted a space for my parents to stay. And so it is insanity. Like you open the door and it's just crammed with bin after bin after bin of fabric. And I've been making masks and doing a lot of sewing and machines. So it's covered with shreds of fabric and thread. And it just looks insane. it just looks like crazy town. So, you know, I keep that door closed and I work in there and I can't even, <laughs> I can't stand up like I, there's not enough room between me and the machine so I have to kind of slide sideways to get out it's it's crazy it's um, crazy so I think that I think the challenge of this quarantine period if you will or even just the stay at home is that um that we're all having to get used to different spaces and still complete the same kind of work and I think you know yeah. we get routinized about how we conduct ourselves at work um and yeah you know, you, how has how has that sort of big change other than having the kids around you has it impacted your the actual work that you're doing like are you thinking about your work differently because you're trapped in the guest room so to speak or um yeah i would say so i mean i, I the the big shift for me is mental i mean i just don't i need i need a lot of uninterrupted time mm -hmm. It almost doesn't matter what I'm doing. It just takes time for me to, I feel like I just kind of, I guess, literally like, well, it's not literal, but I decompress. I mean, it's just, a, I need to kind of expand into the space before anything happens. So often I'll spend a day in the studio and really nothing happens until 4 p.m. And mm -hmm. I've been in here and I've been puttering and I've been messing with stuff and I feel like I've been doing stuff but it doesn't it doesn't even matter like even if I feel like I'm procrastinating just being here being alone being in the silence or you know even if I'm listening to music or whatever mm -hmm. but just not having anybody else's brain in my brain um is what I really need and so the space um is really secondary to that um 
I mean, that being said, one of the nice things I like about textile work and needlework is that unlike painting, say, which really you need a dedicated space that's just for that, it's very hard to have mm -hmm. to set up in a corner of your house or whatever. Um, but with needlework, I, I, I almost always have some kind of home project going that I can do um, that sort of requires, I, I've already gotten it started. So the mental part of kind of making decisions about it has already happened. And so then it's just the work. And I find that in itself very meditative and very kind of soothing and I really enjoy it. So I always have something going at home anyway. So I always keep like a lot of the needlework stuff that I keep, all the materials, I keep that at home. I've always kept mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I've always been, I feel like right. my, the, um, my, my work life and my motherhood um, are always a kind of just, you know, it's just the best, I, it, I manage it best when I just have sort of been able to surf, you know, just kind of ride whatever's happening at the time and, you know. Yeah, which is great, which is great. Yeah. So family, talking about being mom, um, yeah. I'm also the mother of three kids, by the way, although I don't think they'd want to be called kids anymore, but, um, oh, fam you know, family relationships though, are you know they're there forever right they're not an ephemeral thing they are a permanent thing and they often are very complicated we all know that um and your work is very much based on the women in your life that have influenced you in some way or another um especially your mom and your grandmother and so tell us a little bit about your work and how through your work you're able to sort through those relationships a little bit yeah i I don't know how much sort of, you know, emotional breakthroughs I run. <laughs> I'm not mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. that I would feel like it's therapeutic necessarily in that sense, but I do, mm -hmm. um, because I, uh, partly because I think that um, I mean, one of the, the core elements of my work, I think, is um, dichotomies. I mean, just mm -hmm. things. I really am interested in, in in things that don't fit and sort of forcing them together, seeing if I can make them work. And so um, I I often, and I also think that this is the result of sort of when I, like how old I am and when I was studying and stuff and sort of growing up in the age of irony, basically. Uh, but there's a, mm -hmm. I resist kind of, coming to conclusions in my work. Um, I resist mm -hmm. work that says like, yes, this is the answer. Um, and I like the kind of confusion and uncertainty that's there. Um, and so I don't feel like I, you know, resolve things necessarily in my work, but, um, but I do do, I guess, a lot of thinking about it and, um, And I do find ways of connecting. I mean, I think the materials I use are really about connection. And um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're often, you know, found objects or uh, family objects. So they've been used, which is something I really respond to. And they have their own energy. And I'm always, like, deeply fond of them. I have to really like the objects. They have to feel sympathetic somehow. Um, and so somehow, you know, using materials that relate to family members, it's a kind of transference of fondness, of affection um, and connection, even if I don't really feel like I have an, a greater understanding necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, with some of the pieces you, I did to get there, but. Do you find, so in the work that you've created that uses these family objects, which is a big part of what you do generally, yeah do the objects come to you, so to speak, or are you looking for objects? Do you have in your head, oh, I'm, I'd like to do something related to that thing I saw in so-and-so's house or drawer, or do they come to you in a different way? <laughs> well, I guess sometimes both. I mean, I guess sometimes both. It, it, I really, it's the, it's the, ob um, so I have been working on some pieces that are based on an ancestor, a piece that I saw in um, in a, an archive that was owned by an ancestor of mine. And that 
has sparked a kind of whole series of ideas that are um, kind of the foundation of a new series of work. Um, but usually the objects that I'm actually, I mean, I'm not going to use that object. It's a bracelet. Um, I'm not going to be using it. But the objects that I actually use, um, those are, it's not predetermined. Like I'll find objects. I mean, if you, my studio is just jammed with stuff. And so I will, you know, wander around in a daze holding something in my hand and then be like, oh, maybe this thing fits with that and then stick it together. But it's very, um, I try to sort of know as little as possible about what I'm doing while I'm doing it, basically, because the more I tell myself what I'm doing, the more airless the work gets somehow. It doesn't work. I think what's interesting about your work, too, is that you, um, you know, the art of making anything usually involves a tool. It involves our hands as tools, but yeah. also physically a tool often is used to create something. Um, and you use a lot of those tools, if you will, in your work and make us look at them very differently. You know, you oh, yeah, yeah, as, as subject. Tape. Yeah, uh, you know, we may have to look at a piece of duct tape in a piece that you've created and look at it as a work of art. And right. um, that is very appealing to me. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in objects in that way. But but also like, for example, the piece, one of the pieces at Woodlawn you use these these wrenches at the bottom of a dress. And yes. I think what's beautiful about those is it takes people a while to realize that what they are and right. they're sewn in um, as any piece would be sewn into a piece of embroidery or, or clothing. So right. it makes you think, oh, that's what I want to use for this particular, if, that's a, if there's a way of you capturing. Um, well for that piece, that piece I was specifically, um, I, I had started off working on that whole body of work because I was thinking about my family's relationship to slavery. I'm from this old mm -hmm. Wasp family and mm -hmm. uh, this particular thread of my family um, had been, you know, abolitionists and very sort of uh, moral, a, a long line of sort of moral crusaders. And so there was a lot of admiration in my family um, my living family for this group of people. And I had always been kind of interested and puzzled by this sort of level of ancestor worship, because on the one hand, of course, I was pleased to feel that I had these morally upright, you know, this connection to this history. And it was one that mm -hmm. I personally agree with in terms of their positions on these things. But on the other hand, I don't feel that I can take any kind of, it says anything about me that i and descended from these people. That doesn't sort of mean anything to me in a way. So um, I was always kind of confused by that. And so I had started off doing work about it, trying to sort of understand, get, see, do see, I was doing research and making work simultaneously, although one didn't directly drive the other necessarily. But I, um, I was sort of trying to get a better sense um, than just the family story about these people and sort of try to understand it a little bit better. And um, so the work that I was making, um, one of the things that I decided early on that was kind of a constant was I was interested in incorporating pieces of iron. And that came from initially that I had found a piece of cast iron that was at um, my mother's house, which had been her grandmother's house. And it was just lying around. It had been something to do with the door hardware or something. And it was just lying around. And I said, oh, can I? It was a beautiful shape. And I said, oh, can I, can I have this? And my mom said, sure. She's used to me kind of just cherry picking objects that drift around. And, um, and then I started thinking about iron and cast iron and the material and how I felt that was sort of, um, it happened as a result of handling the object, but it also became sort of a metaphor for me of slavery and, it, and a way of, mm -hmm. A feeling that the I mean, literally the feeling the past was heavy. That's why those ended up in there. But it also went along with, I, I feel like sometimes the odd things that I put in are a way of kind of writing, like uh, adjusting the direction of the ship. Like I don't really know where I'm going, but it feels more right to go in this direction than that direction. And so if I feel like it's getting too, um, 
you know, full of itself or fine art, like I'll often try to say like, well, what if I'd stick some duct tape on there and, and you know, nudge it back into a kind of more everyday, yeah. uh, down to earth kind of accessible material place. Um, so that, I mean, it's sort of like that. I mean, but often if I feel like it's getting too predictable, I'll, um, you know, but the other thing about tape and the tools is that um, because I work with so many different kinds of materials, um, I I could have a workshop the size of, you know, a 50,000 square foot warehouse and still not have enough tools because I work with iron and concrete and wood and, you know, so because I don't have my own table saw, for example, or, you know, a lot of the material, you know, a welder, I did a little bit of welding in college, it's been a long time and I'm not prepared to, you know, weld. Um, but so I end up having to come up with very weird ways of combining the material. Connecting things. Yeah. Connecting things. Yeah. And so yeah. tape is one of my favorites and thread and string are another one that you can connect most things as it turns out with tape and string. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are, <laughs> What's right. interesting to me is that your work, especially the other um, piece that's that's on a mannequin, which I've got to read this because I can never remember the total name of it, which is Genteel. Yeah gown of feminine blindness which i always loved is really it's my favorite piece as you know in the exhibition but it seems to bring together in a sense all these bits like all these complicated things are put together into this stunning um stunning embroidered and a gown with lots of other materials incorporated so how did that come about and, and is that did it come about in a similar way to the other piece or was that what made you believe that at that point you were done you know because it seems to be so layered right um, family relationships are very layered as well of course and yes. um what, yeah what would you say i'm done the doneness is tricky i mean i definitely um I mean, part of the reason I was done was because the show happened. And so <laughs> the, the okay. first one that's show, good. That's hey, good. it's now done. Right. Uh, and I did yeah. contemplate adjusting it later. There was like, a, I, I was, I had a, another idea. Sometimes, I mean, I still have pieces that are being tweaked now and again, you know, when they come back to the mm -hmm. studio, look at them again. I'm like, oh, now mm -hmm. I can fix this or whatever. Um, but I also think, um, it just reached, it, in general, I mean, there might be a tweak here and there, but in general, it felt, um, it felt dense enough, I guess. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's really where it, it um, I was trying to get to a point where it felt complicated enough. It felt layered enough, I guess. And so then I it finally seemed to sort of have gotten there and that was when I stopped. But um, but that piece, yeah, so I had been making these pieces um, and that one started, I'm not sure it's, it's, how did it start, I think? I had, So I was playing around with the idea of just making um, things that you could wear, but, I, I at that point was feeling very um, unsure as to sort of how to people would say, oh, well, are they costumes? I'm like, no, they're not costumes. Like, oh, are they, you know, things you're going to wear? No, not, it's not really, I mean, they're things you wear, but they're not really costumes, but they're not really objects. I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. So I had started off making that thing. Um, I know I had sort of begun part of it, but I hadn't really figured out what I was going to do with it. And then at the same time, so I had been doing this research about the um, the northern thread of my family, um, and then oddly enough, so my mother is a fiction writer, and she was also working on, and we we did not, she does not talk about her work in, uh, for a long time when she's working on something. So I didn't realize what she was doing, and it turned out we were both kind of on the same track parallel tracks, but she was writing a novel, which has since come out and done very well, um, about the Southern branch of her father's family. And 
they she was writing about her her father's grandparents um, and his grandmother was a woman, young woman who had um, who had grown up in the South in Baton Rouge and then lived in Charleston. And she had published um, a book of her diaries during the Civil War called A Confederate Girl's Diary. Um, mm -hmm. And so after talking to my mother, and I had never, I had read bits and pieces of it before, but um, I hadn't read much of it. And so I started, after talking to my mother about this, I started reading her book, well, her diary again. And I was really struck by the, there were a couple of passages that ended up really influencing that one piece that you're talking about. Um, early on, so she, first of all, she's an incredible writer. She, she writes beautifully, beautifully. Um, and she can you tell us the name of the book <laughs> yeah no it's called a confederate girl's diary oh or that's the name of her book yeah, okay yeah there it, her name is sarah morgan sarah mm -hmm. morgan dawson and there were, i think it was published a couple of different times so um i can send you the link maybe if you need the name of it um because i feel like i always call it a confederate girl's diary but then it turns out it's slightly different than that but i'll send <laughs> you the link and see if i can find it um so there were a couple pieces, parts of it that really influenced it. One, the first one that I came across um, was in the midst of her description of flirting with an officer who's been stationed near um, their house. She um, talks with real rage about how she has not gotten the same educational opportunities as her brothers um, because she's a girl and she's just filled with frustration and real anger about this. And it was such a, a just electric feeling of connection. It felt such like such a contemporary um, position to take. And it's so surprising to hear um, in the midst of these discussions of like her clothes and not that she was um, flighty or, you know, silly she doesn't have that kind of voice but she did talk about her clothes she was a you know 18 year old girl and that was you know mm -hmm. she was really interested mm -hmm. in that so in the middle of those conversations for her to just be so vividly aware be able to cut through the structure that she lived in to perceive this um this difference and to resent it i thought was really impressively um perceptive of her and i just was so sympathetic and was really really struck by this connection that we had um but then later in the book um she so that their family had they did have um they did have enslaved people in the household and um there but there wasn't much discussion of them one way or the other in the earlier part of the book. Um, so despite aware being, and also she refers to them as servants, even though I know that they were um, enslaved people. So, mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't much discussion of them in this section of the book, but later on she, on the run from the shelling, the um, Union attack on Baton Rouge, they go to a sugar plantation owned by somebody that they know. And there's this insane description of her and the other young people going down to the sugar rendering house and having this interaction with the enslaved people who were working there. 24 seven in like what must have been actually really brutal conditions and how the young people go in and they 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 work for a few minutes and she talks about how you know happy the people who were working there were that they were showing that they could pitch in sort of um and it just seemed so blind to me just such a complete how could it not be a willful ignorance to the reality of these relationships that she's describing in this way that just could not have been the case? Um, and it was just so shocking to me, this ignorance. Um, and then there was a third, there were, there was a third section that I was really struck by because throughout this journal she talks mostly about the confederate troops as being you know our brave boys and several many 
you know, siblings and cousins and we're all off um, fighting. And, um, and at some point she wishes that she could go and fight. And, you know, there's great sort of solidarity with the Confederate cause. And, um, and so she describes them as being very gallant and very, you know, protective and whatever. But then there's a description of how her mother has gotten angry with her because they're staying in a house and she has stepped out on the veranda without wearing a veil over her face while there were troops in the street. And her mother is furious. And the suggestion is, and this is all sort of implicit, but I thought it was quite clear, the suggestion seemed to be that her mother felt that she had put them in danger by being, by exposing her face to, as a young, attractive woman, mm to these tr male troops and that they were a house filled with women. I mean, she had her sisters there and her mother there and stuff. And so I was so struck by this dual understanding of who the troops were and what, whether they were protectors or threats and the idea that they could be somehow both, but in this very unexamined way. Um, so that was part of the construction of that gown. I mean, the fact that there are no sleeves that she felt restricted. You, if you put it on, you can't move your arms. Um, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, and the sort of headdress with the things in front, this, this sense of blindness and reference to the veil that I just described. Um, but it also really made me, I was glad that I'd had the experience of feeling connected to her when she talked about these sort of proto-feminist issues. Um, because what I ended up feeling was that, you know, this sense of like, well, what am I blind to? I mean, here's this woman mm -hmm. that I can relate to and she's intelligent and she's interesting and she's thoughtful. And here she is living in the structure that she lives in and not seeing these brave injustices. And, you know, I'm sure we all do that. And so it was, um, so in terms of the piece, it was, I also, I, I, I wasn't supposed to be a piece condemning her as much as sort of, I don't know, um, indicating the restrictions and the uh, limitations, but yeah. in a way. Or you your know, understanding that things have, you know, that for you, everything has changed and for you, things are different. And for you, you right. get to move around the world in a very different way, perhaps, I which, think. you know, has a tension of its own, um, that we are, don't actually, we aren't actually like our mothers all the time, that, you know, um, that our moms are, uh, lived in a different moment, just as our own children will see, see it that way as well, I think. Um, yeah. Other yeah. worked at a time where most people didn't, and yet now that, you know, it's much more typical. So right. I think all sort of take that experience that our mother or grandmother had, and then we have to sort of process it in a way, what would we have been like in that environment? Because we get to do something completely different and make completely different decisions. Right, right. I mean, and I think, especially sort of in this political climate, um, I just want to make clear, I'm not in any way sort of excusing my ancestors' participation in the system of slavery. I mean, I find it absolutely appalling. Um, but I think. But it's your history. And but it's my history. And I want to be, for one thing, yeah. I want to be overt about it. I think there's been a lot of sort of pretending that this didn't happen or distancing from it, which I don't think is useful in general. But I mm -hmm. also think mm -hmm. that the instinct to sort of demonize those people, otherize one's ancestors because mm -hmm. you know, they must have been monsters for participating um, doesn't it doesn't allow us to learn from what that is and try to mm -hmm. not be that way ourselves. I mean, it's it, for me, it's an exercise in sort of saying, oh, well, she was limited and where I'm like her in some ways, so therefore I must be limited. So where, what should I be looking at? What injustices am I participating in that I could somehow try to dismantle or be more aware of. So it isn't um, so much as like a, well, everybody has their thing as much as a kind of, um, for me, it felt like a more rigorous, like accounting of my family mm -hmm. history in a way. Of, well, I, um, think that, I think that's, I think that's great. And I think, you know, as a director of a site that's sort of trying to tell a more 
you know, as we say at the trust, telling a, the fuller story um, right. means that in our case, we have to talk about Nellie Custis. She is right. a very part of the site, which wouldn't exist without her. And yet right. she's not the only story. She's, but she is a very integral part of what became a different story and what we hope will be much different story for the future. So, right. Right. you know, you can't take that, you can't carve that out. Um, I think that as much as we all, we carved out other stories for too long and right. now right. we don't want to do that anymore. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Well, I think in some ways your piece is ceremonial in a way. Um, and I think, you know, I think some people have looked at it and thought, wow, this is a Native American piece, or this is a, somebody mentioned, um, I was standing by someone at the needlework show who said it was an Alaskan. Is this some sort of indigenous peoples um, piece, you know, and I think an homage, if you will, and, and I, you know, I, it can be what it needs to be for the individual viewer, but um, I think that's really, really, really interesting. Yeah, I know. I, it, that was a little bit, um, I, I, I totally understand why people have that response to the work, and I don't mm -hmm. quite know. Um, I was very anxious to not to not sort of imply some kind of relationship with Native mm -hmm. American traditions that I don't mm -hmm. have and was not trying to usurp or, you know. Um, yeah, but. But it, that was sort of what the work, that's how the work came out. And I think part of it I came from, um, I also think, and this is sort of an ongoing, a long, much more complicated conversation about craft, but I think that there is, um, an emphasis on expertise that's sort of embedded in the way that particularly crafts people perceive their work. Um, but I think as an artist using craft techniques, I approach it differently, which is, again, just to be very clear here, not to suggest that I think that art, there's a hierarchy of fine art here. Mm -hmm. and craft mm -hmm. I don't believe that, but I do think that there is some differences if it's possible to make distinctions without creating a hierarchy, I would mm -hmm. like to try, but um, I approach those techniques um, as sort of necessary ones, but not ones that I would present myself as an expert in, in any way. And so um, there's a kind of looseness to my beetle work or, you know, a sloppiness or sort of a, um, a lack of precision if you're approaching it from a craft perspective. And I think that and I like that because I like the sort of energy that comes out of it. Um, and I like the sense of hand and I like, um, it, it's just also, it's also sort of the way I draw. It's just the way that my mm -hmm. work works out. But I, I'm interested in that there is a kind of somehow, I think that there is a relationship between the, that way that I work and people's, the, the way that it somehow resembles indigenous art and I which is again and not in any way to disparage indigenous art but I think I'm I'm interested in that there's some um there's some there's some relationship there that I haven't quite been able to there's a primitiveness in a sense I think maybe yeah yeah but what you're, what you know, you're getting down to the base the very basic yeah. sometimes and that's right. really important and I think you know, as someone who is not a needle, um, not a needlework artist of any kind, and having looked at many, many, many hundreds of pieces of needlework in my career at Woodlawn, for example, yeah. it's interesting because you have many, many pieces that are very finely um, conceived and executed in terms of technique that are yeah. interesting to look at. And then there are many pieces that are that where the technique is not even necessarily the main point of it. Um, right. Perhaps it's being, the needlework is being used as, as a, a sort of um, a medium for voice. You know, there, there are many reasons people stitch and yeah. there are many pieces that are more haphazard. The technique yeah. is not necessarily as fine or as, um, as focused as a piece that might be judged, for example. And yet they're just, just as powerful and right. just appealing to the people that come and look at it um, right. and, you know, have equal value. 
And sometimes someone will say to me, oh, well, I don't know that my piece will make it into the judging. And I've always responded in the same way, which is, that's not the point. The point is, is that it's your work, it's done by your hand, and yeah. it has equal value in our minds, and it's yeah. just important to, for us to display it. And yeah. so I think that notion that only work that is able to sort of fulfill some sort of jury um, is, you know, that 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 doesn't make it. Um, that work yeah. doesn't. Make it, it's not superior because because right. it got a prize. It gets a prize for many other reasons, including right. the, the the execution and the skill, just like we do. Uh, we, we prize many things that way. But um, like a Michelin chef doesn't necessarily make a better meal than the barbecue guy. It's just right. a different right. meal, and it's right. equally equally right. delicious. But anyway, right. thank you, Roxana. This was fabulous. Um, I, have to, I have to end our video by saying thank you for coming. We are delighted um, that you were able to sit and talk with us. We're looking forward to seeing your home-based video, which I hear is outside-based, and I know what that means. Um, <laughs> did that up yeah, on, and I'm excited <laughs> about that. And um, every weekend we're showing, we're interviewing um, someone and then having them show their own produced video and as part of this makers and creative creators initiative and we're just delighted that you were a part and i really appreciate it well thank you so much man it's always a pleasure to talk to you about all these things and uh, i'm really glad to be welcome. welcome.